We are in Acts. We just finished chapter 2. That is the beginning of the church. It's where the Holy Spirit came. Uh, Peter is now filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking boldly. He's courageous. And now we go into chapter 3. And we go to see the church at work in the following chapters. And I um, want to kind of tell you a little about my process. Um, about two weeks ago, I was walking around my house doing some things and got this impression that God wanted me to preach today. And so um, I kind of went, okay. So I looked up the date, and I'm like, okay. Kind of talked to him a little bit. Text house. He's like, wow, that'll really help me a lot. I felt I'm hearing God's voice. I'm being obedient. I text house. I felt very righteous at that moment. It was an answer to house's prayer because his text back to me was, oh my gosh, this is going to help me a lot. And I'm sure you were praying about how you were going to do everything. And so God spoke to me. I was obedient. And then I thought, gosh, I wonder where we're going to be. So I looked. I'm like, oh, we're going to be in chapter 3. I'm going to look it up, and I'm going to read it. <laughs> what? Healing? Are you kidding me, Lord? Are you kidding me, Lord? We had a discussion right then and there. Lord. Healing is not an easy thing to talk about. At times it is, but it's hard because the words that kept coming to my mind is, I don't know. I don't know. Why are people healed? I don't know. Why are people not healed? I don't know. Why do people die? I don't know. God does. I don't. But I, I was like, well, I can't text house back and tell him I'm not going to preach now. I'm kind of stuck in this. Lord, what am I going to do? And in the back, you know, I kind of hear him chuckling. And I'm like, come on. And he's like, no, you're going to do it. It'll be okay. And so I wrestled with this for two weeks. And when I mean wrestle, you did not want to be living in my head for two weeks. Because it's like, oh, they're healed by faith. Well, not always. They're healed by action. Oh, not always. It's a sin thing. Not always. It's an unforgiveness thing. Not always. Well, why? I don't know. Well, this person was healed and this person died. Why? I don't know. And that pretty much is what's been going on in my head for two weeks. And the Lord, you know, calm my thoughts. But healing is not an easy thing. There's a lot of unknowns. But there's a lot we do know. And so that's what I'm going to talk about, is what we do know. I might still say, I don't know, but, and hopefully I won't leave you more confused than aware or answered questions. So let's go into it. We're going to um, be in chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. <coughs> when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. As brought out, it was interesting that the beggar saw them, but he didn't look at them when he asked them for money. He was probably had that posture, you know, kind of head down, didn't want to look at him. Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them, right? I'm going to get money. Maybe I'll get some food. I'm going to get something good from these two. I just know it because they want me to look at them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. At this moment, I'm sure the man is defeated. Are you kidding me? Why are you wasting my time? Right? You're standing in front of me. Now I can't beg to the other people. Now I can't ask for money from all these people that are passing me by because you're in my way. Right? 
Those are the thoughts that go, I mean, come on, we all have those thoughts. I'm sure those are the thoughts he had. But what I do, Peter went on, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate, the same man that they just passed who was begging them and asking them for money. Begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Healing encompasses a lot of different things. We know that God says we have the power to heal. Jesus said that when I, after I'm gone, you are going to get my, not only my power, but more. You can do things, more things than I did. And that includes healing. That includes praying over people and expecting healing and getting healing. But what does that all encompass? And this is what I got just from this passage. Healing encompasses faith, it encompasses action, trust, and asking the right question. Did the beggar ask the right question? He asked for money, right? Can you give me some money? He didn't realize that God had so much more for him. And he was limiting himself by asking for money. And so this man, he didn't have faith, right? I can't walk, I'm just a beggar. I can't work, I'm just a beggar because I'm lame. Been like this from birth. This is what I do. This is who I am, right? This is my identity, so can you just give me some money and let me go on my way? But God had so much more in store for him. He wanted him to, to be healed. He wanted him to be able to walk, to work, to be a vital part of society. It took faith on the acts of John and Peter to pray and know that they had God's power. It took action on the man's part to actually get up he didn't have faith. He might have trusted... Yeah, I don't think he really trusted Peter and, and John. Peter and John trusted the power of Jesus. And the man, he needed to ask the right question. But sometimes we can do all those things and none of it works. It doesn't happen and sometimes it's not any of that. And this is where the I don't know stuff comes into we don't have the answers. What we're going to do is look at several healing stories in the Bible and looking at the different ways that people are healed using faith and action, trust, looking at sin, looking at unforgiveness. So we're going to go to Matthew 8, 5 through 13. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and I that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, I tr truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. 
Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And the servant was healed at that moment. Now, my question was this. Did the centurion have faith that Jesus was God and was healing? Or did the centurion have faith that Jesus had authority? The centurion had faith that Jesus had authority, and he recognized his authority. He saw the healings. He heard about the feelings, the healings. But did he truly have faith in God, that God was going to heal his servant? Or did he just trust and believe in Jesus' authority as he's seen it on the street? I think he had the faith and the trust in his authority. Now, there's another story of a centurion and his whole household becomes faithful. Many people believe it's the same centurion. And if it is, he became faithful through this healing. By recognizing Jesus' authority, the healing happened, and then he became faithful. So, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we can get healing. Do we always get healing when we have our faith and trust in Jesus? No. I told you. In James 5, 5 through 9, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for so long, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir. The sick man said, For I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. How many times have we? I can't, sir. I can't. I'm too sick. I'm too tired. I'm too faithless. I don't trust. I can't. The man couldn't even ask for help. He was so depleted from being sick for 38 years. He couldn't ask for help for someone to help him into the pool. He just laid there, and people pushed around him. Now, why was it so important? They believed that um, in this pool, when it bubbled up, that was the angels kind of stirring it up, and that people would be healed. When When it bubbled, you ran in, and you'd get healed. And this man, because of his illness, couldn't. He was too weak. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Action. The man didn't really have faith, because he said, I can't. But his action, he listened to Jesus, so he got up and walked. Our action can be part of our healing, just as our faith can. Our action, whether it is in prayer and going to the elders and being anointed, whether it's going to the doctors and getting treatment. Doctors, I've known so, I've worked with doctors for 16 years. I've seen the ones that had God complexes. They weren't the nice ones, and I would tell people to not go to them. And I've seen the ones that truly had the gift of healing, because they cared about the whole person. They knew the medical part, but they cared about the person as well. And they truly did have the gift of healing through medicine. God gave them that gift. They gave them the brain, the knowledge, and the wisdom to help people heal. And so, yes, God sometimes uses medicine. But we also can take action in our lives to help in healing. By the exercise we do, the food that we eat, the things that we put on our body, the things we do, the actions we take. Our actions are part of our healing process, our healing ways. So that's faith and action. Now this is the story of the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. I didn't put the whole thing down. It's a long verse, but go back and read it. It's from, um, 
I didn't put the verse down. I just put the, thank you, Mark 5:34. You could see it on your screen, couldn't you? Yes, I couldn't see it on mine. I'm like, where is it? Um, so, he just, she just memorized, I'm like, okay, I know it's Mark. So, anyways, so she has been bleeding for 12 years. Jesus is in this crowd of people. There are tons of people, we need healing for house, tons of people surrounding Jesus, just pushing on him and, you know, walking with him and his disciples. And this woman sees Jesus and thinks, if I just touch his clothes, he will heal me. If I just touch his clothes, he will heal me. And so she reaches out and she touches her, his clothes and immediately Jesus knows somebody touched him and was healed. His, he felt his power go out. I love this story. It's so like, ooh. And he could stop. Who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples were like, come on. There's tons of people pushing on you. How do you know so everybody's touching you? No, my power went out. The woman was instantly healed of her bleeding. Twelve years of bleeding. Instantly healed. And so she came to Jesus and said, Oh, Jesus, I, it was me. I'm so sorry. I just knew if I touched your cloak, I'd be healed, and I was. I'm going to cry because I love this story. He said to her daughter, Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Be freed from your suffering. Her action plus faith healed her immediately from 12 years of suffering. 12 years of suffering. Faith in action. I've seen people healed just with their faith alone. I've seen people healed with action alone. I've seen people healed with both faith and action. There's no one way of being healed. I told you there's a lot of scripture, which I love. <sighs> Acts 3.3, 3, we go back to our beggar. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Our beggar asked them for money. Asking the right question. What is it that you really need? Did he really need money? Yeah, he probably did to live. But what did he really need? He needed healing. He needed healing not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. So what healing do you really need? When you ask someone to heal your, your knee or your back, is that what really needs to be healed? Because sometimes it's a spiritual issue and we need a spiritual healing. And when we get the spiritual healing, then we get the physical healing. I believe this man, when they said, look at us, saw the love of Christ coming directly from John and Peter's eyes. And it stirred something in his soul. Have you ever had someone say, look at me, and you see the love of God come through? And what that does to you, it pierces your heart. It pierces your whole spirit pierces your soul because at that instant you feel loved you feel acknowledged you feel like someone sees you and that man who had been suffering all his life who had been a nobody had been seen had been acknowledged and been healed when we can go to God and ask the right questions we will be healed it may not look like what we originally wanted, but it will be so much better. God has so much more for us than just taking away a little knee pain. So much more. But we need to ask the right question. Sin. That's a fun one to talk about. In healing, is it a sin issue? Is it an unforgiveness issue? Is it a sin issue? Yes and no. Don't you love this? Yeah, no, maybe, okay. <laughs> Sometimes it is. Sometimes our sin gets in the way that we can't accept anything from God. 
and it blocks his healing power, it blocks his love, it blocks his forgiveness for all of our sins, and we continue to go in the same way. It had blocked that poor man for his entire life, right? He'd been lame from birth. And sometimes it's not. Guess what? I have two Bible passages to show you. Matthew 9, 1 through 8. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or say, Get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to, to the paralyzed man, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority who had given such authority to man. Your sins are forgiven. You're free. Now you can walk. When we are freed from our sins, when we are forgiven and live in that forgiveness state, we are free. We are free to walk. We are free to run. We are free to praise. We are free to be completely healed. And so sometimes, yes, it is a sin issue that we need to seek forgiveness. That's where that ask the right question, pray the right prayer comes into. Sin and forgiveness equals healing and a freedom. When Jesus died on the cross, did he say, well, the sins right now are forgiven, but, you know, in a few years they won't be, and so you'll have to keep doing things. No, he said, as soon as I die on this cross, all sins will be forgiven and you get to live in freedom because I'm going to bear every single sin on my body. I'm going to bear that weight, the brunt of all sin, so that you can live in freedom. What sin or unforgiveness are you living with that may be stopping you from healing? If you don't know, ask the Lord, because guess what? He wants to tell you, and he will. It's not always fun. Trust me. I've done it. Not fun. So here's another one on sin. In John 9, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. From birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Okay, Lord, what sin issue is this? This guy was born blind. There's got to be a sin. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be, dis- be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, which I always thought was gross, <laughs> and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Salome. Salome? I did say that right. Mm. Salome. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So is it a sin issue or not? Yes and no. This man had been born blind. And guess what? Sometimes things happen, but God can be given the glory when the healing happens. When freedom happens, God gets the glory. And that's how his kingdom spreads. Neither sinned. It's all through God's glory. No sin, God's glory. Sin, forgiveness. Yes and no. God can heal in unexpected ways. We never know how that healing is going to look, when it's going to happen. Healing is a process. Now, all the healings we've seen have been pretty much right away. 
it's immediately he's been healed. The man with the mud on his eyes had a whole action to do. It took time. Put the mud on the eyes. Now you go and you go wash. And then he was healed. And here, um, this is Old Testament. So this is even before Jesus. Healings. Somebody asked this morning, when did the first healing happen? Well, the first healing happened in Old Testament times. We had healings throughout the Old Testament. And then Jesus came and he was showing us how to heal, what to do, that healing was possible. And then this was the first healing after Jesus' death, the start of the church. The blind beggar. So we're going to go back to Old Testament, 2 Kings 5, 1 through 15. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Na Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. Well, that's a lot of stuff. The le and heavy, too. I, you know, all the camels. And so it was a huge brigade going into Samaria to find the king. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, Within this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. See, kings had the authority. The girl said to go to Samaria to find the prophet. So they thought, well, who but the king, of course, would be the one to heal. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of this leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. Right? Because, well, I'm not going to be able to peel to heal him so then he's going to go back and then he's going to be mad and it's going to be a whole big thing when Elisha had Elisha uh, the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes which is a huge thing I mean it's like I'm wailing I'm tearing my robes I'm angry um, he sent him this message why have you torn your robes have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel so Naaman went to this went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleaned, cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of, his, of my leprosy. What did Elisha do? He sent his messenger. He sent a messenger. That's like low man sending to a, sir, another, you know, to a, a guard. It's, it's not good. He wanted a spectacle. He expected Elisha to come out. Oh, Lord, you're going to heal this man so everyone could see. He wanted the spectacle. And it's like, no, just go wash in the river. Go wash in the river. So he was angry. Are not Abana and Far Farpar the uh, I love all these words. The rivers the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? I mean the Jordan? Come on, that's a lowly river. I want to go to my rivers. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? Aren't we all looking for the big thing? The big boom? You know, if I'm, my back, I'm crippled because my back hurts. Don't I want, you know, Craig to pray over me and I stand up straight and go, Woohoo! God healed me. Of course we all want that. But that's not how God always works. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes we get the big boom. Sometimes we just need to go cleanse in the Jordan River. You know, go wash your skin off. Now the Jordan, high salt, high salinity, that's really good for your skin. It's a good healing river. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. 
and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel, so please accept a gift from your servant. He didn't accept the gift. But now this man who had no faith in Israel's God, why would he? Who was mad because he didn't get the spectacle, the show, but did the easy thing by going into the river, dipping seven times, and was healed. And now he knew, one, that Elisha was truly a man of God, a prophet, and that God heals, that God was real, God was all-powerful, and it was the, he was the only God. God can heal in unexpected ways. We never know what it's going to look like. We never know how it's going to happen. Now I'm going to share some healing testimonies. How many of you remember Mila, the micropyreme? She was born just less than 26 weeks of gestation. She weighed less than a pound. She was given, I think, a 10% chance to live. And we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. Mila's healing wasn't instantaneous. It took time. It took medical staff that was experts in this field, in micropremies. But it also took prayer of thousands of prayer warriors across this country that prayed for this little girl. Because I would get the call, we don't know that she's going to make it. Her sats are down. This is happening. This is happening. Her body's failing. And I would put out the call, pray, as many of us did, pray and everything would turn around almost instantaneously. The medications were working, and the doctors knew that this was a miracle. They knew that, yes, they had all this great medical intervention that could help her, but they also knew that God's hand was on her. They called her the warrior. They called her Mila the Miracle because they had never seen a child fight like she did. They never saw those times where she's gone, she we're going to lose her. Actually, she was gone at one point, and she came back because our prayers went out. And guess what? She just had her fourth birthday. She is spunky and, you can tell, sassy. She's very smart. Her grandma just was there. My, her grandmother is my cousin, so yes, we are related. Um, this is, so it was a third cousin, twice removed, who knows. She's a cousin. Um, she's smart. She's talking. She's running around like crazy. Does she have some medical issues? Yes. She was a micro preemie. She wasn't supposed to make it. She does have some issues. But we're still praying for her to be healed completely. Her lungs still need healing. She does have issues with her lungs. She has some issue with digestion. But those are, look at her. Obviously, they don't stop her. She runs around with all of her brothers and sisters. She is a true miracle and a true healing story, miracle healing story. Because I know that without our prayers, without the prayers of thousands, she would not be here. She shouldn't be here, but she is. And I thank God for that. Now I want to tell you about a couple of my healing stories. Now healing can happen as a microwave or a crock pot. I got this from Houses with Our Faith. Our, my, our faith can be microwaves or crock pots. What is microwave? Microwave is instantaneous. We get it right now. We get what we want right now. And sometimes healing happens that way. We get it right now. Sometimes it's more like a crock pot. It's a process. It takes time, right? Mila took time. Though we had instances of the microwave, those instantaneous healings, her whole healing took time. So I'm going to tell you my two stories. One's a microwave, one's a crock pot. Migraines. 
How many of you have ever had a migraine? They're horrible, if you haven't. Horrible. So we were doing, this was a long time ago, this was before the church was planted, so we were all at Grace. We were doing an Alpha Away weekend. This is when we all met together. We did weekends, and it's our healing, you know, um, Holy Spirit feeling prayer time weekend. It's a fantastic Saturday, all day Saturday, Sunday, it was Sunday morning, Saturday, all day Saturday, and then Sunday morning. And so I was on the praise team. We were getting up there. We were going to start singing. And I started feeling a little headache coming on. And I thought, well, I really haven't eaten. I need to eat something and I feel better. So I went, sat back at the table, and we were sitting at those big round tables. And I happened, I don't know how this happened, I happened to get stuck next, against the wall with tons of people around me. So I couldn't move. And as I sat there, one of my friends looked at me and she goes, what is wrong with you? I turned pale because all of a sudden I'm nauseous, the light is killing my eyes, and I have a stabbing pain inside my head that I thought I was going to die. It was so fast. It came on so fast that it surprised me. And so I sat there, and I was kind of like leaning over, and I was like, I haven't had one of these in a while. I don't have any of my stuff with me. Oh my God, it's all at home. I'm looking through my bag, which I usually carry. Kim thinks it's my pharmacy, my natural pharmacy. But looking through my bag, I didn't really have anything. I think I had some ibuprofen, but you know, at that point I knew that's not what I needed. I needed some stronger stuff. I needed some other stuff. And so I couldn't get out. I needed, I felt claustrophobic. I was getting claustrophobic. Even though I'm not a claustrophobic person, I started getting claustrophobic. I felt the room coming in because there was people in there and it was hot and I was heating. I started sweating. I'm like, oh dear God, I'm going to throw up and I can't get out. And so break came. I ran to the bathroom. I didn't throw up, thank God. But I sat in there and it was cold and I'm just, I just sat in there sweating and thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? How am I going to do this? I can't drive home at this point. I think somebody has a hotel room. Maybe I can go lay down. And so I finally came out, washed my hands, and Kathy and Michelle and Karen and a few others, as I came out, grabbed me and they said, come here. They sat me in a chair out in the hall. They pulled out a chair, sat me in a chair and said, what's wrong with you? because I looked like I was going to die. I felt like it was, said migraine. Oh, okay, we gotta start praying for this girl. They laid hands on my shoulders, on my head, on my knees. I had hands just everywhere on me and they started praying. And as they started praying, my shoulders went down and I could feel, starting at my toes, everything starting to lift. The nausea, light sensitivity, the pain. And one of the ladies, I think it was Michelle, said, whoa! And I said, what? She says, I just saw a black cloud just poof right off of you. And when that happened, they said, how do you feel? And I said, oh my gosh, so much better. I still had a little um, fogginess from it, but I didn't have any pain. My nausea was gone. my sensitivity to light was gone. And I knew at that point what I needed was food because I hadn't been able to eat because I'd been sick and now it's almost lunchtime. So I just need some food. And so it's almost lunchtime. So we went, I'm putting food on it. They're like, well, you must be feeling better. I said, oh, I feel so much better. And once I got the food in me, I was fine. That was the fastest I had ever gotten rid of a migraine because they laid hands, these lovely women friends of mine, laid hands on me and prayed. Strong, bold, expectant prayers. And just like that, my migraine was gone. And any of you that have had migraines know how long they can last. Right? Mine usually would last almost a day and I would take meds and then I'd sleep for a day and then I'd be good. So, that was it. Now my wrist. 
Not all of you were here during my wrist fiascos. I had injured my wrist at work, wrist at work ended up having a bunch of surgeries. I, I tore the ligament two or three times, so I had pins in it and caps. Um, so other stuff happened, so then they'd have to go back in and clean stuff out and release this and do this. And it, I was in a cast or a wrist brace for years. You never saw my left hand without a brace on it for years. And this one particular time, again at Alpha. This is why you need to go to Alpha. <laughs> Because things happen at Alpha. This, I forgot this one happened at Alpha too. Come Wednesday night, talk to Alan. You need to go to Alpha. Um, so my wrist, I'd re-injured my wrist. Now this was at the absolute lowest time of my life. I'd been let go of my, I'd been laid off from my job, which was unexpected. My, my house had flooded. Um, yeah, Wendy's like, oh geez, I remember that time. It was horrible. Every, didn't matter it happened. Um, I picked up an empty plastic, you know, I bought a, a container at Target and I picked it up both hands because, you know, and I felt the ligament tear in my wrist again. I threw that thing in my car and I was like, are you kidding me? I was so angry. I knew exactly what had happened. It had torn again. I was so upset. Then my water heater broke and flooded my kitchen. Everything that could happen happened at this time. And so here we are at Alpha. We're at the healing night service. I'm on the praise team. I shouldn't have been on the praise team because I was not real happy with God. House is standing. We're, we're again, before this church ever was planted, the house is standing on kind of, probably like if it would be in the back part of this room. And he's like, Tamara, how you doing? How's the wrist? Guess what? That was the wrong question to ask me. I stormed over to him and said, well, and he's like, well, you're at a good place because it's healing night. We can pray for your wrist. If God wanted me healed, they would have never happened. Put a fork in me, I'm done. I walked away. Went back up to where the praise team was because I was going to sing and be all holy, right? I was not in a good spot. I turn around to look at him and he's standing there going, what just happened? Oh my, oh my gosh. So here I am and my wrist breaks again, um, waiting to see the, you know, seeing if it'll heal, waiting for the doctors, all this stuff. And it's healing night. And all I wanted to do was run away because I was so sick and tired of this wrist hurting, of having problems and not being healed. And so as I sat there that night, it was all I could do as the prayer teams got up to start praying over people for healing, to stay in that room. And, you know, and at Grace we had pews. And so I literally sat in the very last pew against the wall and I, my hands were curled around the edge of the pew so I wouldn't run out because everything inside of me said leave, run as fast as you can because guess what the voice in my head said God doesn't care he's not healing you because you're not worth it everything in my being said run yet my hands gripped the pews so tightly I couldn't and then all of a sudden God spoke in that gentle voice get up and be healed mm -hmm. and so as I walked over and I remember it was Pastor Luther and Cindy Blosh I'm like Tamara oh we know what you need healing for you need healing for your wrist and I said no I don't my spirit needs healing. My wrist is secondary. My spirit needs healing. At that moment, they cried. I'm crying. It was a blubber fest. And so they started to pray over me. My spirit at that point needed healing, more so than my wrist. And God says, I have so much more for you 
so much better than healing your wrist. That doesn't matter. That's just, that's secondary. That's fourth. That's fifth. That's way down on the bottom. What needs to be healed is you, your, your soul, your spirit, your heart. And I'm going to do that for you tonight. And he did. He healed me. He healed my spirit, and that began a healing that got me here today, right? Did my wrist get healed? Yes, but it was a process. Physical therapy. I did need another surgery, more physical therapy. But guess what? I haven't had any problems since because God healed my spirit. And once that healed, the rest of me could heal, including my wrist. So did I get healed physically? Yeah. And it was a process. It took time. It was a microwave because there was a whole lot of other stuff that needed healing more. God heals in unexpected ways, in different ways. We don't know how he's going to heal us. It might be spiritually. It might be mentally, emotionally. It might be physically. It might be because of unforgiveness or sin. It might be because of our faith. It might be our action. It might be our faith and action and work. We don't know. But what we do know is that we can stand on the promises of God. We can stand on the promises of God that healing is for us today. Why do some people don't get healed? I don't know. I ask that question all the time. I wrestle with God. Why didn't my brother get healed? I don't know. My brother asked the same thing. And guess what? He leaned in closer to God. And so now I know he's in heaven. But I do wrestle with it. I'm not going to lie. And, he's, and God just says, I have better things for him and for you, for his family. We've all leaned into God more since my brother's illness started. We could have gone the other way. We chose to lean in. My brother didn't have a lot of faith. But man, he leaned in. He leaned in. It started with Mila, for him praying for Mila, A man of no faith prayed, and he said, God answered my prayer. What? You prayed? That was my question to him. What? You prayed? Yes, I prayed. She had a hole in her heart, and I prayed that God would heal it and make it so she didn't have to have a surgery. And he goes, he answered my prayer because on her next scan, she didn't have a hole in her heart anymore. It had been healed. And he said, yes, God answered your prayers. He goes, why would he answer my prayers? I'm afraid that if I went into a church, I'd get hit by a lightning bolt. But no, I go, even a sinner like you, Gary, he's going to heal. He's going to answer your prayers. And that started his journey and then his illness. And he leaned in and God spoke to him and he heard his voice. He goes, God spoke to me. He listened to me and he spoke to me. I said, yeah. And he cried when he told me this. Through his illness, he was healed in other ways. His cancer wasn't healed, but his faith, his spirit was healed. (sighs) Shoot, I didn't think I was going to go that deep. All right, practicalities for healing. So what are some things we can do? What can we pray for? How can we pray? What can we do and still maybe not get all the answers? We need to stand on God's promises. And you can only do that if you know his promises. If you don't know his promises, then you better get into the word. That's why we have Bible readings. Get one of the Bible booklets. I will tell you that every single time. That's why we do this. It's so that you can learn the promises of God and stand on them. Because they are true and he is faithful. Your body is God's temple. I have that somewhere. There's a verse. I am so, like, lost on all this that I didn't look at any of my notes. Our bodies are God's temple. We need to treat it as such. If you have acid reflux and keep eating, it praying for healing and keep eating spicy, greasy foods, it's not going to get healed. I'm just telling you, it's not going to get healed. Because guess what? God's trying to put out the fire and you're stoking it. <laughs> right? 
God's with the fire hose. Shh, I'm going to heal you with my fire hose. And in the background, you're going, thanks, Lord. <laughs> Let's stoke this fire. <laughs> after, after all that deepness, I've got to get some brevity in here. <laughs> so don't stoke the fire. Treat your body as a temple. Exercise, food, water, all the good stuff. Self-talk. Do not claim a disease. Please, people, stop it. I'm just going to tell you, stop it. Do not say, I have. I yelled at somebody. He, he had cancer. I kept saying, well, I have this cancer, and he's a godly man. I'm like, stop it. You do not. You were diagnosed with cancer. Big difference. Big difference. Both are true, right? Both are true. But there's a big difference in how it will affect our brain. I was diagnosed with this. Not I have. I was diagnosed with cancer. I was diagnosed with a bad back. I was diagnosed with a bad knee. I was diagnosed with heart disease. I was diagnosed with migraines. I was diagnosed. Which, one gives, God more room to work? Which gives more God room for God to work. I can't even speak right now. <laughs> but I did write something down. I was diagnosed with. Then claim, I have a loving God who wants me to be healed and will heal me. I have a loving God who wants me whole and strengthened. I have a loving God who wants to renew and restore me. Which is better to proclaim? God's promises or our disease? Which is going to give God more, time, more, more opportunity to work? Claiming our disease or claiming his promises? Claim his promises. Know his promises. Get in the Bible if you don't know his promises. Because I'm not going to tell you all of his promises. you got to find them out. Start it. Oh, okay, so do not claim your diseases. Say you were diagnosed and claim God's promises. Self-check. Am I just... Do oh, thank you for pushing. I forgot. Self-check. Or self-talk, I should say. Self-check. I'm so lost. I don't know where I'm at anymore. Unforgiveness. Do you have sin in your life? Is there something? Do a self-check. Is there something going on in your life that is stopping you from being healed? That can happen. You know, I was, my, my arm wasn't, my wrist wasn't being healed because I had a lot of stuff in the way. I was letting the evil one dictate in my head what God wanted to do. Well, that was wrong. That was stupid, right? So I needed my spirit healed. I then mentally I needed to be healed and to hear God's voice again. I heard it, but I it was being drowned out a lot too. So self check. See what see what needs to be healed. Um, do you have unforgiveness or sin in your life that just isn't allowing God to work? Ask, what needs healing? Physical or spiritual? God will tell you if you ask him. Now you can't just ask him and go on your way, you have to ask and wait. And listen. Don't ask and expect. Just ask, expect, listen. So sit there with him. Get in his word. Pray. Talk to him. Ask him, what do I need? Spiritual. Do I need physical? What do I need? Oh, okay, pray. When you're praying, pray with boldness. Pray with expect expectancy. Pray with faith. I was with someone that was praying and they had the most beautiful prayer it was bold it was expectant it was full of faith it was full of trust in the Lord and then it all went downhill they said if it's your will Lord and if it's not your will that he is healed then give him peace and I'm like stop stop just stop right there stop it it is God's will that we are healed. God does not want disease and sickness in this world. That's an that's a evil person. That's the sin of the world. That's the corruption of the world. God wants us to have healthy, disease-free bodies. His will is that we don't have pain and suffering. And we will ultimately have that when we get to heaven. But for now, His will is that we be healed. So when... The person that was praying started going to that. Guess what happened? I can't tell you how quickly the power, the Holy Spirit, the air was sucked out of that room. Because we had had these bold prayers. 
And you could feel God's energy, the Holy Spirit in there, working. And then it was like, <laughs> gone. Because this guy turned on a heel and started questioning everything he just prayed for. So pray bold, expectant, faith-filled he, uh, prayers. Pray for strength. When you pray for someone healing, sickness in the Bible is weakness. So if sickness is weakness, we pray for strength, right? We can pray for wellness, but we want to actually pray for strength. So when I pray, if you've ever heard me pray, I usually will pray um, strength. If it's a back problem, um, Lord, I ask for strength and healing in the muscles, um, in the ligaments, in the tendons, you know, and I, I pray for strength for that person. Um, so pray for strength, not just illness. Um, we pray the promises and not the problems as well. So you don't say, oh, Lord, um, I, can't even, I don't even do it, so now I can't even think how to do it. <laughs> That's a good problem to have, right? I can't even give you an example because I don't pray this way. But people will pray like, oh, my cancer, this, this, and this. But don't. Pray the promises. Lord, you, you promise healing. So we are praying healing and strength into this person. We are praying restoration. We were praying renewal. We were praying for the cancer to be gone. Live a good long life. Pray for strength. Have the elders come and anoint you. In, um, in James 5.14, it says to go to the, if you're sick, go to the elders. This is why I don't use notes, because it confuses me more. Go to the elders and be anointed. Have them pray over you. Um, another way of saying this is don't do it alone. Don't suffer in silence. I know so many people that are like, I didn't want to bother God. <laughs> so many more people are hurting more than me. It's just a little something. No, guess what? It's important to God. You're important to God. And he doesn't want you to do it alone. Peter and John were there for this man. And what did they do? They offered, one, look at me. They wanted him to be acknowledged. Know that we see you. We're going to heal you, and now I'm going to help you. They reached out his hand and helped him up. We don't do this faith thing alone. We do this with others. We do this. That's why we meet on Sundays. We do this. Oh, my gosh, it's late. We do this <laughs> faith thing. Sorry, I, could, I knew this was going to be a long one. Um, faith thing together. So don't do it alone. Go to the elders for anointing and prayer. Pray as if healing has already happened with thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for the healing that has already happened in Mila. Thank you, Lord, for the healing that is happening now. And thank you, Lord, for the healing that is going to continue to happen in her life so that she can be, live a whole, happy life. Amen. Simple prayer. But you always pray as if as the healing is happening right now, even if it's not a boom microwave healing, that it's a microwave, you pray for and thank God for the healing that is happening now. Pastor Joe Johnson taught me that many, many years ago. Pray and thank God for the healing that has happened now. In 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. You have been healed. Praise him, come on up. By his wounds you have been healed. Our healing started on the cross with forgiveness of sins, with the death and resurrection. By his wounds we have been healed. We can live in freedom, and healing can happen. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it does. What we do know, though, that God is good. He is gracious, and he has so much more for us than what we could possibly know or ask for.